Chapter fifty nine of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume One, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What took place at Portsmouth, August twenty third, sixteen twenty eight. Felton took leave of Milady as a brother about to go for a mere walk takes leave of his sister, kissing her hand. His whole body appeared in its ordinary state of calmness. Only an unusual fire beamed from his eyes, like the effects of a fever. His brow was more pale than it generally was, his teeth were clenched, and his speech had a short, dry accent which indicated that something dark was at work within him. As long as he remained in the boat which conveyed him to land, he kept his face toward Milady, who, standing on the deck, followed him with her eyes. Both were free from the fear of pursuit. Nobody ever came into Milady's apartment before nine o'clock, and it would require three hours to go from the castle to London. Felton jumped on shore, climbed the little ascent which led to the top of the cliff, saluted Milady a last time, and took its course toward the city. At the end of a hundred paces the ground began to decline, and he could only see the mast of the sloop. He immediately ran in the direction of Portsmouth, which he saw at nearly half a league before him, standing out in the haze of the morning with its houses and towers. Beyond Portsmouth the sea was covered with vessels whose masts, like a forest of poplars despoiled by the winter, bent with each breath of the wind. Felton, in his rapid walk, reviewed in his mind all the accusations against the favorite of James I and Charles I, furnished by two years of premature meditation and a long sojourn among the Puritans. When he compared the public crimes of this minister, startling crimes, European crimes, if so we may say, with the private and unknown crimes with which Milady had charged him, Felton found that the more culpable of the two men which formed the character of Buckingham was the one of whom the public knew not the life. This was because his love, so strange, so new, and so ardent, made him view the infamous and imaginary accusations of Milady de Winter as through a magnifying glass one views as frightful monsters atoms, in reality imperceptible by the side of an ant. The rapidity of his walk heated his blood still more. The idea that he left behind him, exposed to a frightful vengeance the woman he loved, or rather whom he adored as a saint, the emotion he had experienced to present fatigue altogether exalted his mind above human feeling. He entered Portsmouth about eight o'clock in the morning. The whole population was on foot. Drums were beating in the streets and in the port. The troops about to embark were marching toward the sea. Felton arrived at the palace of the Admiralty, covered with dust and streaming with perspiration. His countenance, usually so pale, was purple with heat and passion. The sentinel wanted to repulse him, but Felton called to the officer of the post, and drawing from his pocket the letter of which he was the bearer, he said, A pressing message from Lord de Winter. At the name of Lord de Winter, who was known to be one of the Grace's most intimate friends, the officer of the post gave orders to let Felton pass, who besides wore the uniform of a naval officer. Felton darted into the palace. At the moment he entered the vestibule, Another man was entering likewise, dusty, out of breath, leaving at the gate a post-horse which, on reaching the palace, tumbled on his foreknees. Felton and he addressed Patrick, the duke's confidential lackey, at the same moment. Felton named Lord de Winter. The unknown would not name anybody, and pretended that it was to the duke alone he would make himself known. Each was anxious to gain admission before the other. Patrick, who knew Lord de Winter, was in affairs of the service, and, in relations of friendship with the duke, gave the preference to the one who came in his name. The other was forced to wait, and it was easily to be seen how he cursed the delay. The valet led Felton through a large hall in which waited the deputies from La Rochelle, headed by the Prince de Soubise, and introduced him into a closet where Buckingham, just out of the bath, was finishing his toilet, upon which, as at all times, he bestowed extraordinary attention. "'Lieutenant Felton, from Lord de Winter,' said Patrick. "'From Lord de Winter,' repeated Buckingham. "'Let him come in.' 
Felton entered. At that moment, Buckingham was throwing upon a couch a rich toilet robe, worked with gold, in order to put on a blue velvet doublet embroidered with pearls. "'Why didn't the baron come himself?' demanded Buckingham. "'I expected him this morning.' "'He desired me to tell your grace,' replied Felton, "'that he very much regretted not having that honor, but that he was prevented by the guard he is obliged to keep at the castle. "'Yes, I know that,' said Buckingham. "'He has a prisoner.' "'It is of that prisoner that I wish to speak to your grace,' replied Felton. "'Well, then speak.' "'That which I have to say of her can only be heard by yourself, my lord.' "'Leave us, Patrick.' said Buckingham, but remain within the sound of the bell. I shall call you presently. Patrick went out. We are alone, sir, said Buckingham. Speak. My lord, said Felton, the Baron de Winter wrote to you the other day to request you to sign an order of embarkation relative to a young woman named Charlotte Boxen. Yes, sir, and I answered him, to bring or send me that order, and I would sign it. Here it is, my lord. Give it to me, said the duke, and taking it from Felton, he cast a rapid glance over the paper, and perceiving that it was the one that had been mentioned to him, he placed it on the table, took a pen, and prepared to sign it. Pardon, my lord, said Felton, stopping the duke, but does your grace know that the name of Charlotte Baxon is not the true name of this young woman yes sir i know it replied the duke dipping the quill in the ink then your grace knows her real name asked felton in a sharp tone i know it and the duke put the quill to the paper felton grew pale and knowing that real name my lord replied felton will you sign it all the same Doubtless, said Buckingham, and rather twice than once. I cannot believe, continued Felton in a voice that became more sharp and rough, that your grace knows that it is to Milady de Winter this relates. I know it perfectly, although I am astonished that you know it. And will your grace sign that order without remorse? Buckingham looked at the young man haughtily. "'Do you know, sir, that you are asking me very strange questions, and that I am very foolish to answer them?' "'Reply to them, my lord,' said Felton. "'The circumstances are more serious than you perhaps believe.' Buckingham reflected that the young man, coming from Lord de Winter, undoubtedly spoke in his name and softened. "'Without remorse,' said he, "'the baron knows as well as myself "'that Milady de Winter is a very guilty woman "'and is treating her very favorably "'to commute her punishment to transportation.' "'The duke put his pen to the paper. "'You will not sign that order, my lord,' "'said Felton, making a step toward the duke. "'I will not sign this order, and why not?' "'Because you will look into yourself, and you will do justice to the lady.' "'I should do her justice by sending her to Tyburn,' said Buckingham. "'This lady is infamous.' "'My lord, Milady de Winter is an angel. "'You know that she is, and I demand her liberty of you.' "'Bah! Are you mad to talk to me thus?' said Buckingham. "'My lord, excuse me. I speak as I can. I restrain myself. But, my lord, think of what you are about to do, and beware of going too far.' "'What do you say? God pardon me,' cried Buckingham. "'I really think he threatens me.' "'No, my lord. I still plead, and I say to you, one drop of water suffices to make the full vase overflow. One slight fault, 
may draw down punishment upon the head spared despite many crimes mr felton said buckingham you will withdraw and place yourself at once under arrest you will hear me to the end my lord you have seduced this young girl you have outraged defiled her repair your crimes toward her let her go free and i will exact nothing else from you you will exact said buckingham looking at felton with astonishment and dwelling upon each syllable of the three words as he pronounced them my lord continued felton becoming more excited as he spoke my lord beware all england is tired of your iniquities my lord you have abused the royal power which you have almost usurped my lord you are held in horror by god and men god will punish you hereafter but i will punish you here ah this is too much cried buckingham making a step toward the door felton barred his passage i ask it humbly of you my lord said he sign the order for the liberation of milady de winter remember that she is a woman whom you have dishonored withdraw sir said buckingham or i will call my attendant and have you placed in irons you shall not call said felton throwing himself between the duke and the bell placed on a stand encrusted with silver beware my lord you are in the hands of god in the hands of the devil you mean cried buckingham raising his voice so as to attract the notice of his people without absolutely shouting sign my lord sign the liberation of milady de winter said felton holding out a paper to the duke by force you are joking halloa patrick sign my lord never never help shouted the duke and at the same time he sprang toward his sword but felton did not give him time to draw it he held the knife with which milady had stabbed herself open in his bosom at one bound he was upon the duke at that moment patrick entered the room crying a letter from france my lord from france cried buckingham forgetting everything and thinking from whom that letter came Felton took advantage of this moment and plunged the knife into his side up to the handle. "'Ah, traitor!' cried Buckingham. "'You have killed me!' "'Murder!' screamed Patrick. Felton cast his eyes round for means of escape, and seeing the door free, he rushed into the next chamber in which, as we have said, the deputies from La Rochelle were waiting, crossed it as quickly as possible, and rushed toward the staircase— but upon the first step he met lord de winter who seeing him pale confused livid and stained with blood both on his hands and face seized him by the throat crying i knew it i guessed it but too late by a minute unfortunate unfortunate that i am felton made no resistance lord de winter placed him in the hands of the guards who led him while awaiting further orders to a little terrace commanding the sea, and then the baron hastened to the duke's chamber. At the cry uttered by the duke and the scream of Patrick, the man whom Felton had met in the antechamber rushed into the chamber. He found the duke reclining upon a sofa, with his hand pressed upon the wound. Laporte, said the duke in a dying voice, Laporte, do you come from her? yes monseigneur replied the faithful cloak-bearer of anne of austria but too late perhaps silence laporte you may be overheard patrick let no one enter oh i cannot tell what she says to me my god i am dying and the duke swooned meanwhile lord de winter the deputies the leaders of the expedition the officers of buckingham's household had all made their way into the chamber 
Cries of despair resounded on all sides. The news which filled the palace with tears and groans soon became known and spread itself throughout the city. The report of a cannon announced that something new and unexpected had taken place. Lord de Winter tore his hair. "'Too late by a minute!' cried he. "'Too late by a minute! Oh, my God! My God! What a misfortune!' He had been informed at seven o'clock in the morning that a rope ladder floated from one of the windows of the castle. He had hastened to Milady's chamber, had found it empty, the window open, and the bars filed, had remembered the verbal caution D'Artagnan had transmitted to him by his messenger, had trembled for the duke, and running to the stable without taking time to have his horse saddled, had jumped upon the first he found, had galloped off like the wind had alighted below in the courtyard, and ascended the stairs precipitately, and on the top step, as we have said, had encountered Felton. The duke, however, was not dead. He recovered a little, reopened his eyes, and hope revived in all hearts. "'Gentlemen,' said he, "'leave me alone with Patrick and Laporte. "'Ah, is that you, de Winter?' You sent me a strange madman this morning. I see the state in which he has put me. Oh, my lord, cried the baron, I shall never console myself. And you would be quite wrong, my dear de Winter, said Buckingham, holding out his hand to him. I do not know the man who deserves being regretted during the whole life of another man. But leave us, I pray you. The baron went out sobbing. There only remained in the closet of the wounded duke, Laporte, and Patrick. A physician was sought for, but none was yet found. You will live, my lord. You will live repeated the faithful servant of Anne of Austria on his knees before the duke's sofa. "'What has she written to me?' said Buckingham feebly, streaming with blood and suppressing his agony to speak of her he loved. "'What has she written to me? Read me her letter.' "'Oh, my lord,' said Laporte, "'obey Laporte.' Do you not see I have no time to lose? The port broke the seal and placed the letter before the eyes of the duke, but Buckingham in vain tried to read out the writing. Read, said he. Read, I cannot see. Read, then, for soon perhaps I shall not hear, and I shall die without knowing what she has written to me. Laporte made no further objection, and read, My lord, by that which, since I have known you, have suffered by you and for you, I conjure you, if you have any care for my repose, to countermand those great armaments which you are preparing against France, to put an end to a war of which is publicly said religion is the ostensible cause, and of which it is generally whispered your love for me is the concealed cause. This war may not only bring great catastrophes upon England and France, but misfortune upon you, my lord, for which I should never console myself. Be careful of your life, which is menaced, and which will be dear to me from the moment I am not obliged to see an enemy in you, your affectionate Anne. Buckingham collected all his remaining strength to listen to the reading of the letter, then when it was ended, as if he had met with a bitter disappointment, he asked, "'Have you nothing else to say to me by the living voice, Laporte?' "'The queen charged me to tell you to watch over yourself, for she had advice that your assassination would be attempted.' "'And is that all? Is that all?' replied Buckingham impatiently. She likewise charged me to tell you that she still loved you. Ah, said Buckingham, God be praised. 
my death then will not be to her as the death of a stranger laporte burst into tears patrick said the duke bring me the casket in which the diamond studs were kept patrick brought the object desired which laporte recognized as having belonged to the queen now the scent bag of white satin on which her cipher is embroidered in pearls patrick again obeyed here laporte said buckingham these are the only tokens i ever received from her this silver casket and these two letters you will restore them to her majesty and as a last memorial he looked round for some valuable object you will add he still sought but his eyes darkened by death encountered only the knife which had fallen from the hand of felton still smoking with the blood spread over its blade and uh, you will add to them this knife said the duke pressing the hand of laporte he had just strength enough to place the scent bag at the bottom of the silver casket and to let the knife fall into it making a sign to laporte that he was no longer able to speak then in a last convulsion which this time he had not the power to combat he slipped from the sofa to the floor patrick uttered a loud cry buckingham tried to smile a last time but death checked his thought which remained engraved on his brow like a last kiss of love at this moment the duke's surgeon arrived quite terrified he was already on board the admiral's ship where they had been obliged to seek him he approached the duke took his hand held it for an instant in his own and letting it fall all is useless said he he is dead 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 cried patrick at this cry all the crowd re-entered the apartment and throughout the palace and town there was nothing but consternation and tumult as soon as lord de winter saw buckingham was dead he ran to felton whom the soldiers still guarded on the terrace of the palace wretch said he to the young man who since the death of buckingham had regained that coolness and self-possession which never after abandoned him wretch what have you done i have avenged myself said he avenged yourself said the baron rather say that you have served as an instrument to that accursed woman but i swear to you that this crime shall be her last i don't know what you mean replied felton quietly and i am ignorant of whom you are speaking my lord i killed the duke of buckingham because he twice refused you yourself to appoint me captain i have punished him for his injustice that is all de winter stupefied looked on while the soldiers bound felton and could not tell what to think of such insensibility one thing alone however threw a shade over the pallid brow of felton at every noise he heard the simple puritan fancied he recognized the step and voice of milady coming to throw herself into his arms to accuse herself and die with him all at once he started his eyes became fixed upon a point in the sea commanded by the terrace where he was with the eagle glance of a sailor he had recognized there where another would have seen only a gull hovering over the waves the sail of a sloop which was directed toward the coast of france he grew deadly pale placed his hand upon his heart which was breaking and at once perceived all the treachery one last favor my lord said he to the baron what asked his lordship what a clock is it the baron drew out his watch 
it wants ten minutes to nine said he milady had hastened her departure by an hour and a half as soon as she heard the cannon which announced the fatal event she had ordered the anchor to be weighed the vessel was making way under a blue sky at great distance from the coast god has so willed it said he with the resignation of a fanatic but without however being able to take his eyes from that ship on board of which he doubtless fancied he could distinguish the white outline of her to whom he had sacrificed his life de winter followed his look observed his feelings and guessed all be punished alone for the first miserable man said lord de winter to felton who was being dragged away with his eyes turned toward the sea but i swear to you by the memory of my brother whom i have loved so much that your accomplice is not saved felton lowered his head without pronouncing a syllable as to lord de winter he descended the stairs rapidly and went straight to the port End of chapter 59. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 60 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In France. The first fear of the King of England, Charles I, on learning of the death of the Duke, was that such terrible news might discourage the Rochelais. He tried, says Richelieu in his memoirs, to conceal it from them as long as possible, closing all the ports of his kingdom and carefully keeping watch that no vessel should sail until the army which Buckingham was getting together had gone, taking upon himself, in default of Buckingham, to superintend the departure. He carried the strictness of this order so far as to detain in England the ambassadors of Denmark, who had taken their leave, and the regular ambassador of Holland, who was to take back to the port of Flushing the Indian merchantmen of which Charles I had made restitution to the United Provinces. But as he did not think of giving this order till five hours after the event, that is to say, till two o'clock in the afternoon, two vessels had already left the port, the one bearing, as we know, Milady, who already anticipating the event, was further confirmed in that belief by seeing the black flag flying at the masthead of the admiral's ship. As to the second vessel, we will tell hereafter whom it carried and how it set sail. During this time nothing new occurred in the camp at La Rochelle. Only the king, who was bored, as always, but perhaps a little more so in camp than elsewhere, resolved to go incognito and spend the festival of St. Louis at St. Germain, and asked the cardinal to order him an escort of only twenty musketeers the cardinal who sometimes became weary of the king granted this leave of absence with great pleasure to his royal lieutenant who promised to return about the fifteenth of december m de treville being informed of this by his eminence packed his portmanteau and as without knowing the cause he knew the great desire and even imperative need which his friends had of returning to paris it goes without saying that he fixed upon them to form part of the escort. The four young men heard the news a quarter of an hour after M. de Treville, for they were the first to whom he communicated it. It was then that D'Artagnan appreciated the favor the cardinal had conferred upon him in making him at last enter the musketeers, for without that circumstance he would have been forced to remain in the camp while his companions left it. It goes without saying that this impatience to return toward Paris had for a cause the danger which Madame Bonacieux would run of meeting at the convent of Bethune with Milady, her mortal enemy. Aramis, therefore, had written immediately to Marie Michon, the seamstress at Tours, who had such fine acquaintances, to obtain from the queen authority for Madame Bonacieux to leave the convent, and to retire either into Lorraine or Belgium. They had not long to wait for an answer. Eight or ten days afterward Aramis received the following letter. My dear cousin, here is the authorization from my sister to withdraw our little servant from the convent of Bethune, the air of which you think is bad for her. 
My sister sends you this authorization with great pleasure, for she is very partial to the little girl, to whom she intends to be more serviceable hereafter. I salute you, Marie Michon. To this letter was added an order conceived in these terms. At the Louvre, August 10th, 1628, the superior of the convent of Bethune will place in the hands of the person who shall present this note to her the novice who entered the convent upon my recommendation and under my patronage, Anne. It may be easily imagined how the relationship between Aramis and a seamstress, who called the queen her sister, amused the young men. But Aramis, after having blushed two or three times up to the whites of his eyes at the gross pleasantry of Porthos, begged his friends not to revert to the subject again, declaring that if a single word more was said to him about it, he would never again implore his cousins to interfere in such affairs. There was no further question, therefore, about Marie Michon among the four musketeers, who besides had what they wanted, that was, the order to withdraw Madame Bonacieux from the convent of the Carmelites of Bethune. It was true that this order would not be of great use to them while they were in the camp at La Rochelle, that is to say, at the other end of France. Therefore D'Artagnan was going to ask leave of absence of M. de Treville, confiding to him candidly the importance of his departure, when the news was transmitted to him, as well as to his three friends, that the king was about to set out for Paris with an escort of twenty musketeers, and that they formed part of the escort. Their joy was great. The lackeys were sent on before with the baggage, and they set out on the morning of the 16th. The cardinal accompanied his majesty from Sergier to Maus, and there the king and his minister took leave of each other with great demonstrations of friendship. The king, however, who sought distraction while traveling as fast as possible, for he was anxious to be in Paris by the 23rd, stopped from time to time to fly the magpie, a pastime for which the taste had been formerly inspired in him by de Loigne, and for which he had always preserved a great predilection. Out of the twenty musketeers, sixteen, when this took place, rejoiced greatly at this relaxation, but the other four cursed it heartily. D'Artagnan, in particular, had a perpetual buzzing in his ears, which Porthos explained thus. "'A very great lady has told me that this means that somebody is talking of you somewhere.' At length the escort passed through Paris on the twenty-third, in the night. The king thanked M. de Treville, and permitted him to distribute furloughs for four days, on condition that the favored parties should not appear in any public place, under penalty of the Bastille. The first four furloughs granted, as may be imagined, were to our four friends. Still further, Athos obtained of M. de Treville six days instead of four, and introduced into these six days two more nights, for they set out on the 24th at five o'clock in the evening, and as a further kindness, M. de Treville post-dated the leave to the morning of the 25th. "'Good Lord!' said D'Artagnan, who, as we have often said, never stumbled at anything. "'It appears to me that we are making a great trouble of a very simple thing. In two days, and by using up two or three horses, that's nothing, I have plenty of money. I am at Bethune. I present my letter from the Queen to the Superior, and I bring back the dear treasure I go to seek.' not into Lorraine, not into Belgium, but to Paris, where she will be much better concealed, particularly while the cardinal is at La Rochelle. Well, once returned from the country, half by the protection of her cousin, half through what we have personally done for her, we shall obtain from the queen what we desire. Remain, then, where you are, and do not exhaust yourselves with useless fatigue. Myself and Planchet are all that such a simple expedition requires." To this Athos replied quietly, "'We also have money left, for I have not yet drunk all my share of the diamond, and Porthos and Aramis have not eaten all theirs. We can therefore use up four horses as well as one. But consider, D'Artagnan,' said he in a tone so solemn that it made the young man shudder, "'consider that Bethune is a city where the cardinal has given rendezvous to a woman who wherever she goes, brings misery with her. If you had only to deal with four men, D'Artagnan, I would allow you to go alone. You have to do with that woman. We four will go, and I hope to God that with our four lackeys we may be in sufficient number. "'You terrify me, Athos,' cried.
cried D'Artagnan. "'My God! What do you fear?' "'Everything,' replied Athos. D'Artagnan examined the countenances of his companions, which, like that of Athos, wore an impression of deep anxiety, and they continued their route as fast as their horses could carry them, but without adding another word. On the evening of the twenty-fifth, as they were entering Arras, and as D'Artagnan was dismounting at the inn of the Golden Harrow to drink a glass of wine, a horseman came out of the post-yard, where he had just had a relay, started off at a gallop, and with a fresh horse took the road to Paris. At the moment he passed through the gateway into the street, the wind blew open the cloak in which he was wrapped, although it was in the month of August, and lifted his hat, which the traveler seized with his hand the moment it had left his head, pulling it eagerly over his eyes. D'Artagnan, who had his eyes fixed upon this man, became very pale, and let his glass fall. "'What is the matter, monsieur?' said Planchet. "'Oh, come, gentlemen, my master is ill!' The three friends hastened toward D'Artagnan, who, instead of being ill, ran toward his horse. They stopped at the door. "'Well, where the devil are you going now?' cried Athos. "'It is he!' cried D'Artagnan, pale with anger and with sweat on his brow. "'It is he! Let me overtake him!' "'He? What he?' asked Athos. "'He! That man!' "'What man?' that cursed man my evil genius whom i have always met with when threatened by some misfortune he who accompanied that horrible woman when i met her for the first time he whom i was seeking when i offended our athos he whom i saw on the very morning madame bonacieux was abducted i have seen him that is he i recognize him when the wind blew upon his cloak the devil said athos musingly to saddle gentlemen to saddle let us pursue him and we shall overtake him my dear friend said aramis remember that he goes in an opposite direction from that in which we are going that he has a fresh horse and ours are fatigued so that we shall disable our own horses without even a chance of overtaking him let the man go d'artagnan let us save the woman "'Monsieur! Monsieur!' cried a hostler, running out and looking after the stranger. "'Monsieur! Here is a paper which dropped out of your hat. Eh, monsieur! Eh!' "'Friend,' said D'Artagnan, "'half a pistole for that paper.' Uh, "'My faith, monsieur, with great pleasure. Here it is.' The hostler, enchanted with the good day's work he had done, returned to the yard. D'Artagnan unfolded the paper. Well, eagerly demanded all his three friends. Nothing but one word, said D'Artagnan. Yes, said Aramis, but that one word is the name of some town or village. Armentiere, read Porthos. Armentiere, I don't know such a place. And that name of a town or village is written in her hand cried Athos. "'Come on, come on,' said D'Artagnan. "'Let us keep that paper carefully. Perhaps I have not thrown away my half-pistole. To horse, my friends, to horse!' And the four friends flew at a gallop along the road to Bethune. End of chapter 60 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 61 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carmelite Convent at Bethune Great criminals bear about them a kind of predestination, which makes them surmount all obstacles, which makes them escape all dangers up to the moment which a wearied providence has marked as the rock of their impious fortunes. It was thus with Milady. She escaped the cruisers of both nations and arrived at Boulogne without accident. When landing at Portsmouth, Milady was an Englishwoman whom the persecutions of the French drove from La Rochelle. When landing at Boulogne after two days' passage, she passed for a Frenchwoman whom the English persecuted at Portsmouth out of their hatred for France. 
Milady had likewise the best of passports, her beauty, her noble appearance, and the liberality with which she distributed her pistoles. Freed from the usual formalities by the affable smile and gallant manners of an old governor of the port, who kissed her hand, she only remained long enough at Boulogne to put into a post a letter, conceived in the following terms. To his eminence, Monseigneur the Cardinal Richelieu, in his camp before La Rochelle. Monseigneur, let your eminence be reassured. His Grace the Duke of Buckingham will not set out for France. Milady de Boulogne, evening of the 25th. P.S. According to the desire of your eminence, I report to the convent of the Carmelites at Bethune, where I will await your orders. Accordingly, that same evening, Milady commenced her journey. Night overtook her. She stopped and slept at an inn. At five o'clock the next morning, she again proceeded, and in three hours after, entered Bethune. She inquired for the convent of the Carmelites and went thither immediately. The superior met her. Milady showed her the cardinal's order. The abbess assigned her a chamber and had breakfast served. All the past was effaced from the eyes of this woman, and her looks fixed on the future beheld nothing but the high fortunes reserved for her by the cardinal, whom she had so successfully served without his name being in any way mixed up with the sanguinary affair. The ever-new passions which consumed her gave to her life the appearance of those clouds which float in the heavens, reflecting sometimes azure, sometimes fire, sometimes the opaque blackness of the tempest, and which leave no traces upon the earth behind them but devastation and death. After breakfast the abbess came to pay her a visit. There is very little amusement in the cloister, and the good superior was eager to make the acquaintance of her new boarder. Milady wished to please the abbess. This was a very easy matter for a woman so really superior as she was. She tried to be agreeable, and she was charming, winning the good superior by her varied conversation and by the graces of her whole personality. The abbess, who was the daughter of a noble house, took particular delight in stories of the court, which so seldom travel to the extremities of the kingdom, and which, above all, have so much difficulty in penetrating the walls of convents, at whose threshold the noise of the world dies away. Milady, on the contrary, was quite conversant with all aristocratic intrigues, amid which she had constantly lived for five or six years. She made it her business, therefore, to amuse the good abbess with the worldly practices of the court of France, mixed with the eccentric pursuits of the king. She made for her the scandalous chronicle of the lords and ladies of the court, whom the abbess knew perfectly by name touched lightly on the amours of the queen and the duke of buckingham talking a great deal to induce her auditor to talk a little but the abbess contented herself with listening and smiling without replying a word milady however saw that this sort of narrative amused her very much and kept at it only she now let her conversation drift toward the cardinal but she was greatly embarrassed she did not know whether the abbess was a royalist or a cardinalist she therefore confined herself to a prudent middle course. But the abbess, on her part, maintained a reserve still more prudent, contenting herself with making a profound inclination of the head every time the fair traveler pronounced the name of his eminence. Milady began to think she should soon grow weary of a convent life. She resolved then to risk something in order that she might know how to act afterward. Desirous of seeing how far the discretion of the good abbess would go, she began to tell a story, obscure at first, but very circumstantial afterward, about the cardinal, relating the amours of the minister with Madame d'Aguillon, Marion de Lorme, and several other gay women. The abbess listened more attentively, grew animated by degrees, and smiled. Good, thought Milady. She takes pleasure in my conversation. If she is a cardinalist, she has no fanaticism, at least. She then went on to describe the persecutions exercised by the cardinal upon his enemies. The abbess only crossed herself without approving or disapproving. This confirmed Milady in her opinion that the abbess was rather royalist than cardinalist. Milady therefore continued, coloring her narrations more and more. I am very ignorant of these matters, said the abbess at length, but... 
however distant from the court we may be however remote from the interests of the world we may be placed we have very sad examples of what you have related and one of our boarders has suffered much from the vengeance and persecution of the cardinal one of your boarders said milady oh my god poor woman i pity her then and you have reason for she is much to be pitied imprisonment menaces ill-treatment she has suffered everything but after all resumed the abbess monsieur cardinal has perhaps plausible motives for acting thus and though she has the look of an angel we must not always judge people by the appearance good said milady to herself who knows i am about perhaps to discover something here i am in the vein she tried to give her countenance an appearance of perfect candor alas said milady i know it is so it is said that we must not trust to the face but in what then shall we place confidence if not in the most beautiful work of the lord as for me i shall be deceived all of my life perhaps but i shall always have faith in a person whose countenance inspires me with sympathy you would then be tempted to believe said the abbess that this young person is innocent the cardinal pursues not only crimes said she there are certain virtues which he pursues more severely than certain offences permit me madame to express my surprise said the abbess at what said milady with the utmost ingenuousness at the language you use what do you find so astonishing in that language said milady smiling you are the friend of the cardinal for he sends you hither and yet and yet i speak ill of him replied milady finishing the thought of the superior at least you don't speak well of him that is because i am not his friend said she sighing but his victim but this letter in which he recommends you to me is in order for me to confine myself to a sort of prison from which he will release me by one of his satellites but why have you not fled whither should i go do you believe there is a spot on the earth which the cardinal cannot reach if he takes the trouble to stretch forth his hand if i were a man that would barely be possible but what can a woman do this young boarder of yours has she tried to fly no that is true but she that is another thing i believe she is detained in france by some love affair ah <sighs> said milady with a sigh if she loves she is not altogether wretched then said the abbess looking at milady with increasing interest i behold another poor victim alas yes said milady the abbess looked at her for an instant with uneasiness as if a fresh thought suggested itself to her mind you are not an enemy of our holy faith said she hesitatingly who i cried milady i a protestant oh no i call to witness the god who hears us that on the contrary i am a fervent catholic then madame said the abbess smiling be reassured the house in which you are shall not be a very hard prison and we will do all in our power to make you cherish your captivity you will find here moreover the young woman of whom i spoke who is persecuted no doubt 
in consequence of some court intrigue she is amiable and well behaved what is her name she was sent to me by some one of high rank under the name of kitty i have tried not to discover her other name kitty cried milady what are you sure that she is called so yes madame do you know her milady smiled to herself at the idea which had occurred to her that this might be her old chambermaid there was connected with the remembrance of this girl a remembrance of anger and a desire of vengeance disordered the features of milady which however immediately recovered the calm and benevolent expression which this woman of a hundred faces had for a moment allowed them to lose and when can i see this young lady for whom i already feel so great a sympathy asked milady why this evening said the abbess today even but you have been traveling these four days as you told me yourself this morning you rose at five o'clock you must stand in need of repose go to bed and sleep at dinner time we will rouse you although milady would very willingly have gone without sleep sustained as she was by all the excitements which a new adventure awakened in her heart ever thirsting for intrigues she nevertheless accepted the offer of the superior during the last fifteen days she had experienced so many and such various emotions that if her frame of iron was still capable of supporting fatigue her mind required repose she therefore took leave of the abbess and went to bed softly rocked by the ideas of vengeance which the name of kitty had naturally brought to her thoughts she remembered that almost unlimited promise which the cardinal had given her if she succeeded in her enterprise she had succeeded d'artagnan was then in her power one thing alone frightened her that was the remembrance of her husband of the comte de la fere whom she had believed dead or at least expatriated and whom she found again in athos the best friend of d'artagnan but alas if he was the friend of d'artagnan he must have lent him his assistance in all the proceedings by whose aid the queen had defeated the project of his eminence if he was the friend of d'artagnan he was the enemy of the cardinal and she doubtless would succeed in involving him in the vengeance by which she hoped to destroy the young musketeer all these hopes were so many sweet thoughts for milady so rocked by them she soon fell asleep she was awakened by a soft voice which sounded at the foot of her bed she opened her eyes and saw the abbess accompanied by a young woman with light hair and delicate complexion who fixed upon her a look full of benevolent curiosity the face of the young woman was entirely unknown to her each examined the other with great attention while exchanging the customary compliments both were very handsome but of quite different styles of beauty milady however smiled in observing that she excelled the young woman by far in her high air and aristocratic bearing it is true that the habit of a novice which the young woman wore was not very advantageous in a contest of this kind the abbess introduced them to each other when this formality was ended as her duties called her to chapel she left the two young women alone the novice seeing milady in bed was about to follow the example of the superior but milady stopped her how madame said she i have scarcely seen you and you already wish to deprive me of your company upon which i had counted a little i must confess for the time i have to pass here no madame replied the novice only i thought i had chosen my time ill you were asleep you are fatigued well said milady what can those who sleep wish for a happy awakening this awakening you have given me allow me then to enjoy it at my ease and taking her hand she drew her toward the armchair by the bedside the novice sat down how unfortunate i am said she i have been here six months without the shadow of recreation 
you arrive and your presence was likely to afford me delightful company yet i expect in all probability to quit the convent at any moment how you are going soon asked milady at least i hope so said the novice with an expression of joy which she made no effort to disguise i think i learned you had suffered persecutions from the cardinal continued milady that would have been another motive for sympathy between us what i have heard then from our good mother is true you have likewise been a victim of that wicked priest hush said milady let us not even here speak thus of him all my misfortunes arise from my having said nearly what you have said before a woman whom i thought my friend and who betrayed me are you also the victim of a treachery no said the novice but of my devotion of a devotion to a woman i loved for whom i would have laid down my life for whom i would give it still and who has abandoned you is that it i have been sufficiently unjust to believe so but during the last two or three days i have obtained proof to the contrary for which i thank god for it would have cost me very dear to think she had forgotten me but you madame you appear to be free continued the novice and if you were inclined to fly it only rests with yourself to do so whither would you have me go without friends without money in a part of france with which i am unacquainted and where i have never been before oh cried the novice as to friends you would have them wherever you want you appear so good and are so beautiful that does not prevent replied milady softening her smile so as to give it an angelic expression my being alone or being persecuted hear me said the novice we must trust in heaven there always comes a moment when the good you have done pleads your cause before god and see perhaps it is a happiness for you humble and powerless as i am that you have met with me for if i leave this place well i have powerful friends who after having exerted themselves on my account may also exert themselves for you oh when i said i was alone said milady hoping to make the novice talk by talking of herself it is not for want of friends in high places but these friends themselves tremble before the cardinal the queen herself does not dare to oppose the terrible minister i have proof that her majesty notwithstanding her excellent heart has more than once been obliged to abandon to the anger of his eminence persons who had served her trust me madame the queen may appear to have abandoned those persons but we must not put faith in appearances the more they are persecuted the more she thinks of them and often when they least expect it they have proof of a kind remembrance alas said milady i believe so the queen is so good oh you know her then that lovely and noble queen that you speak of her thus cried the novice with enthusiasm that is to say replied milady driven into her entrenchment that i have not the honor of knowing her personally but i know a great number of her most intimate friends i am acquainted with monsieur de putange i met monsieur du Hart in england i know monsieur de treville monsieur de treville exclaimed the novice do you know monsieur de treville yes perfectly well intimately even the captain of the king's musketeers the captain of the king's musketeers why then only see cried the novice we shall soon be well acquainted almost friends if you know monsieur de treville you must have visited him often said milady who having entered this track and perceiving that falsehood succeeded was determined to follow it to the end with him then you must have seen some of his musketeers all those he is in the habit of receiving replied milady for whom this conversation began to have a real interest 
name a few of those whom you know and you will see if they are my friends well said milady embarrassed i know monsieur de louvigny monsieur de courtivron monsieur de Fahoussac. the novice let her speak then seeing that she paused she said don't you know a gentleman named athos milady became as pale as the sheets in which she was lying and mistress as she was of herself she could not help uttering a cry seizing the hand of the novice and devouring her with looks what's the matter good god asked the poor woman have i said anything that has wounded you no but the name struck me because i also have known that gentleman and it appeared strange to me to meet with a person who appears to know him well oh yes very well not only him but some of his friends messieurs porthos and aramis indeed you know them likewise i know them cried milady who began to feel a chill penetrate her heart well if you know them you know that they are good and free companions why do you not apply to them if you stand in need of help that is to say stammered milady i am not really very intimate with any of them i know them from having heard one of their friends monsieur d'artagnan say a great deal about them you know monsieur d'artagnan cried the novice in her turn seizing the hands of milady and devouring her with her eyes then remarking the strange expression of milady's countenance she said pardon me madame you know him by what title why replied milady embarrassed why by the title of friend you deceive me madam said the novice you have been his mistress it is you who have been his mistress madame cried milady in her turn i said the novice yes you i know you now you are madame bonacieux the young woman drew back filled with surprise and terror oh do not deny it answer continued milady well yes madame said the novice are we rivals the countenance of milady was illumined by so savage a joy that under any other circumstances madame bonacieux would have fled in terror but she was absorbed by jealousy speak madame resumed madame bonacieux with an energy of which she might not have been believed capable have you been or are you his mistress oh no cried milady with an accent that admitted no doubt of her truth never never i believe you said madame bonacieux but why then did you cry out so do you not understand said milady who had already overcome her agitation and recovered her presence of mind how can i understand i know nothing can you not understand that monsieur d'artagnan being my friend might take me into his confidence truly do you not perceive that i know all your abduction from the little house at saint germain his despair that of his friends and their useless inquiries up to this moment how could i help be astonished when without having the least expectation of such a thing i meet you face to face you of whom we have so often spoken together you whom he loves with all his soul you whom he had taught me to love before i had seen you ah dear constance i have found you then i see you at last and milady stretched out her arms to madame bonacieux who convinced by what she had just said saw nothing in this woman whom an instant before she had believed her rival but a sincere and devoted friend oh pardon me pardon me cried she sinking upon the shoulders of milady pardon me i love him so much these two women held each other for an instant in a close embrace certainly if milady's strength had been equal to her hatred madame bonacieux would never have left that embrace alive 
but not being able to stifle her, she smiled upon her. "'Oh, you beautiful, good little creature,' said Milady. "'How delightful I am to have found you! Let me look at you!' And while saying these words, she absolutely devoured her by her looks. "'Oh, yes, it is you indeed. From what he has told me, I know you now. I recognize you perfectly.' The poor young woman could not possibly suspect what frightful cruelty was behind the rampart of that pure brow, behind those brilliant eyes in which she read nothing but interest and compassion. "'Then you know what I have suffered,' said Madame Bonacieux, "'since he has told you what he has suffered, but to suffer for him is happiness.' Milady replied mechanically, "'Yes, that is happiness.' She was thinking of something else. "'Ah, then,' continued Madame Bonacieux, "'my punishment is drawing to a close. Tomorrow, this evening, perhaps, I shall see him again, and then the past will no longer exist.' "'This evening?' asked Milady, roused from her reverie by these words. "'What do you mean? Do you expect news from him?' "'I expect himself.' himself d'artagnan here himself but that's impossible he is at the siege of la rochelle with the cardinal he will not return till after taking the city ah you fancy so but is there anything impossible for my d'artagnan the noble and loyal gentleman oh i cannot believe you well read then said the unhappy young woman, in the excess of her pride and joy, presenting a letter to Milady. "'The writing of Madame de Chevreuse,' said Milady to herself. "'Ah, I always thought there was some secret understanding in that quarter.' And she greedily read the following few lines. "'My dear child, hold yourself ready. Our friend will see you soon.' and he will only see you to release you from that imprisonment in which your safety required you should be concealed. Prepare, then, for your departure, and never despair of us. Our charming Gascon has just proved himself as brave and faithful as ever. Tell him that certain parties are grateful for the warning he has given. Yes, yes, said Milady. The letter is precise. Do you know what that warning was? No, I only suspect he has warned the queen against some fresh machinations of the cardinal. Yes, that's it, no doubt, said Milady, returning the letter to Madame Bonacieux and letting her head sink pensively upon her bosom. At that moment they heard the gallop of a horse. Oh, cried Madame Bonacieux, darting to the window, can it be he? Milady remained still in bed, petrified by surprise. So many unexpected things happened to her all at once that for the first time she was at a loss. He, he, murmured she, can it be he? And she remained in bed with her eyes fixed. Alas, no, said Madame Bonachieux. It is a man I don't know, although he seems to be coming here. Yes, he checks his pace. He stops at the gate. He rings. Milady sprang out of bed. You are sure it is not he? said she. Yes, yes, very sure. Perhaps you did not see well. Oh, if I were to see the plume of his hat, the end of his cloak, I should know him. Milady was dressing herself all the time. Yes, he has entered. It is for you or me. My God! How agitated you seem! Yes, I admit it. I have not your confidence. I fear the cardinal. Hush! said Madame Bonacieux. Somebody is coming. Immediately the door opened and the superior entered. Do you come from Boulogne? demanded she of Milady. Yes, replied she, trying to recover her self-possession. Who wants me? a man who will not tell his name but who comes from the cardinal and and who wishes to speak with me 
who wishes to speak to a lady recently come from Boulogne. Then let him come in, if you please. Oh, my God, my God, cried Madame Bonacieux. Can it be bad news? I fear it. I will leave you with this stranger, but as soon as he is gone, if you will permit me, I will return. Permit you? I beseech you. The superior and Madame Bonacieux retired. Milady remained alone with her eyes fixed upon the door. An instant later the jingling of spurs was heard upon the stairs. Steps drew near, the door opened, and a man appeared. Milady uttered a cry of joy. This man was the Comte de Rochefort, the demoniacal tool of his eminence. End of chapter 61 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 62 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Varieties of Demons Ah! cried Milady and Rochefort together. It is you. Yes, it is I. And you come? asked Milady. From La Rochelle. And you? from england buckingham dead or desperately wounded as i left without having been able to hear anything of him a fanatic has just assassinated him ah said rochefort with a smile this is a fortunate chance one that will delight his eminence have you informed him of it i wrote to him from boulogne but what brings you here his eminence was uneasy and sent me to find you i only arrived yesterday and what have you been doing since yesterday i have not lost my time oh i don't doubt that do you know whom i have encountered here no guess how can i that young woman whom the queen took out of prison the mistress of that fellow d'artagnan yes madame bonacieux with whose retreat the cardinal was unacquainted well well said rochefort here is a chance which may pair off with the other monsieur cardinal is indeed a privileged man imagine my astonishment continued milady when I found myself face to face with this woman. Does she know you? No. Then she looks upon you as a stranger? Milady smiled. I am her best friend. Upon my honor, said Rochefort, it takes you, my dear countess, to perform such miracles. And it is well I can, Chevalier, said Milady, for do you know what is going on here? No. They will come for her tomorrow, or the day after, with an order from the Queen. Indeed. And who? D'Artagnan and his friends. Indeed. They will go so far that we shall be obliged to send them to the Bastille. Why is it not done already? What would you? The cardinal has a weakness for these men which I cannot comprehend. Indeed? Yes. Well, then tell him this, Rochefort. Tell him that our conversation at the inn of the Red Dovecot was overheard by these four men. Tell him that after his departure, one of them came up to me and took from me by violence the safe conduct which he had given me. Tell him they warned Lord de Winter of my journey to England that this time they nearly foiled my mission as they foiled the whole affair of the studs. Tell him that among these four men two only are to be feared, D'Artagnan and Athos. Tell him that the third, Aramis, is the lover of Madame de Chevreuse. He may be left alone, we know his secret, and it may be useful. As to the fourth, Porthos, he is a fool, a simpleton, a blustering booby, not worth troubling himself about. 
But these four men must now be at the siege of La Rochelle. I thought so too, but a letter which Madame Bonacieux has received from Madame the Constable, and which he has had the imprudence to show me, leads me to believe that these four men, on the contrary, are on the road hither to take her away. The devil! What's to be done? What did the cardinal say about me? I was to take your dispatches, written or verbal, and return by post, and when he shall know what you have done, he will advise what you have to do. I must then remain here? Here or in the neighborhood. You cannot take me with you? No. The order is imperative. Near the camp you might be recognized, and your presence, you must be aware, would compromise the cardinal. Then I must wait here or in the neighborhood? Only tell me beforehand where you will wait for intelligence from the cardinal. Let me know always where to find you. Observe, it is probable that I may not be able to remain here. Why? You forget that my enemies may arrive at any minute. That's true. But is this little woman, then, to escape his eminence? Bah! said Milady with a smile that belonged only to herself. You forget that I am her best friend. Ah, that's true. I may then tell the cardinal with respect to this little woman that he may be at ease is that all he will know what that means he will guess at least now then what had i better do return instantly it appears to me that the news you bear is worth the trouble of a little diligence my chaise broke down coming into lillier capital what capital yes i want your chaise and how shall i travel then on horseback you talk very comfortably a hundred and eighty leagues what's that one can do it afterward afterward why in passing through lillier you will send me your chaise with an order to your servant to place himself at my disposal. Well? You have, no doubt, some order from the cardinal about you. I have my full power. Show it to the abbess, and tell her that someone will come and fetch me, either today or tomorrow, and that I am to follow the person who presents himself in your name. Very well. Don't forget to treat me harshly in speaking of me to the abbess. To what purpose? I am a victim of the cardinal. It is necessary to inspire confidence in that poor little Madame Bonacieux. That's true. Now, will you make me a report of all that has happened? Why, I have related the events to you. You have a good memory. Repeat what I have told you. A paper may be lost you are right only let me know where to find you that i may not run needlessly about the neighborhood that's correct wait do you want a map oh i know this country marvelously you when were you here i was brought up here truly it is worth something you see to have been brought up somewhere you will wait for me then let me reflect a little ah that will do at armentier where is that armentier a little town on the lees i shall only have to cross the river and i shall be in a foreign country capital but is it understood you will only cross the river in case of danger that is well understood and in that case, how shall I know where you are? You do not want your lackey? Is he a sure man? To the proof. Give him to me. Nobody knows him. I will leave him at the place I quit, and he will conduct you to me. And you say you will wait for me at Armentier? 
at armentieres write that name on a bit of paper lest i should forget it there is nothing compromising in the name of a town is it not so eh who knows never mind said milady writing the name on half a sheet of paper i will compromise myself well said rochefort taking the paper from milady folding it and placing it in the lining of his hat you may be easy i will do as children do for fear of losing the paper repeat the name along the route now is that all i believe so let us see buckingham dead or grievously wounded your conversation with the cardinal overheard by the four musketeers lord de winter warned of your arrival at portsmouth d'artagnan and athos to the bastille aramis the lover of madame de chevreuse porthos an ass madame bonacieux found again to send you the chaise as soon as possible to place my lackey at your disposal to make you out a victim of the cardinal in order that the abbess may entertain no suspicion armentieres on the bank of the lees is that all then in truth my dear chevalier you are a miracle of memory apropos add one thing what i saw some very pretty woods which almost touched the convent garden say that i am permitted to walk in those woods who knows perhaps i shall stand in need of a back door for retreat you think of everything and you forget one thing what to ask me if i want money that's true how much do you want all you have in gold i have five hundred pistoles or thereabouts i have as much with a thousand pistoles one may face everything empty your pockets there right and you go in an hour time to eat a morsel during which i shall send for a post-horse capital adieu chevalier adieu countess commend me to the cardinal commend me to satan milady and rochefort exchanged a smile and separated an hour afterward rochefort set out at a grand gallop five hours after that he passed through arras our readers already know how he was recognized by d'artagnan and how that recognition by inspiring fear in the four musketeers had given fresh activity to their journey end of chapter sixty two recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter sixty three of the d'artagnan romances volume one the three musketeers by alexandre dumas translated by william robson this librivox recording is in the public domain the drop of water rochefort had scarcely departed when madame bonacieux re-entered she found milady with a smiling countenance well said the young woman what you dreaded has happened this evening or to-morrow the cardinal will send someone to take you away who told you that my dear asked milady i heard it from the mouth of the messenger himself come and sit down close to me said milady here i am wait till i assure myself that nobody hears us why all these precautions you shall know milady arose went to the door opened it looked in the corridor and then returned and seated herself close to madame bonacieux then said she he has well played his part who has he who just now presented himself to the abbess as a messenger from the cardinal it was then a part he was playing yes my child that man then was not that man said milady lowering her voice is my brother your brother cried madame bonacieux no one must know this secret my dear but yourself if you reveal it to any one in the world i shall be lost and perhaps yourself likewise oh my god listen this is what has happened 
my brother who was coming to my assistance to take me away by force if it were necessary met with the emissary of the cardinal who was coming in search of me he followed him at a solitary and retired part of the road he drew his sword and required the messenger to deliver up to him the papers of which he was the bearer the messenger resisted my brother killed him oh said madame bonachieux shuddering remember that was the only means then my brother determined to substitute cunning for force he took the papers and presented himself here as the emissary of the cardinal and in an hour or two a carriage will come to take me away by the orders of his eminence i understand it is your brother who sends this carriage exactly but that is not all that letter you have received and which you believe to be from madame de chevreuse well it is a forgery how can that be yes a forgery it is a snare to prevent your making any resistance when they come to fetch you but it is d'artagnan that will come do not deceive yourself d'artagnan and his friends are detained at the siege of la rochelle how do you know that my brother met some emissaries of the cardinal in the uniform of musketeers you would have been summoned to the gate you would have believed yourself about to meet friends you would have been abducted and conducted back to paris oh my god my senses fail me amid such a chaos of iniquities i feel if this continues said madame bonacieux raising her hands to her forehead i shall go mad stop what i hear a horse's steps it is my brother setting off again i should like to offer him a last salute come milady opened the window and made a sign to madame bonacieux to join her the young woman complied rochefort passed at a gallop adieu brother cried milady the chevalier raised his head saw the two young women and without stopping waved his hand in a friendly way to milady the good george said she closing the window with an expression of countenance full of affection and melancholy and she resumed her seat as if plunged in reflections entirely personal dear lady said madame bonacieux pardon me for interrupting you but what do you advise me to do good heaven you have more experience than i have speak i will listen in the first place said milady it is possible i may be deceived and that d'artagnan and his friends may really come to your assistance oh that would be too much cried madame bonacieux so much happiness is not in store for me then you comprehend it would be only a question of time a sort of race which should arrive first if your friends are the more speedy you are to be saved if the satellites of the cardinal you are lost oh yes yes lost beyond redemption what then to do what to do there would be a very simple means very natural tell me what to wait concealed in the neighborhood and assure yourself who are the men who come to ask for you but where can i wait oh there is no difficulty in that i shall stop and conceal myself a few leagues hence until my brother can rejoin me well i take you with me we conceal ourselves and wait together but i shall not be allowed to go i am almost a prisoner as they believe that i go in consequence of an order from the cardinal no one will believe you anxious to follow me well well the carriage is at the door you bid me adieu you mount the step to embrace me a last time my brother's servant who comes to fetch me is told how to proceed he makes a sign to the postilion and we set off at a gallop but d'artagnan d'artagnan if he comes shall we not know it how nothing easier we will send my brother's servant back to bethune whom as i told you we can trust he shall assume a disguise and place himself in front of the convent if the emissaries of the cardinal arrive he will take no notice if it is monsieur d'artagnan and his friends 
he will bring them to us. He knows them, then? Doubtless. Has he not seen Monsieur d'Artagnan at my house? Oh, yes, yes, you are right. Thus all may go well, all may be for the best, but we do not go far from this place. Seven or eight leagues at the most. We will keep on the frontiers, for instance, and at the first alarm we can leave France. And what can we do there? Wait. But if they come? My brother's carriage will be here first. If I should happen to be any distance from you when the carriage comes for you, at dinner or supper, for instance, do one thing. What is that? Tell your good superior that in order that we may be as much together as possible, you ask her permission to share my repast. Will she permit it? What inconvenience can it be? Oh, delightful! In this way we shall not be separated for an instant. Well, go down to her, then, to make your request. I feel my head a little confused. I will take a turn in the garden. Go, and where shall I find you? Here, in an hour. Here, in an hour. Oh, you are so kind, and I am so grateful. How can I avoid interesting myself for one who is so beautiful and so amiable? Are you not the beloved of one of my best friends? Dear D'Artagnan, oh, how he will thank you! I hope so. Now, then, all is agreed. Let us go down. You are going into the garden? Yes. Go along this corridor, down a little staircase, and you are in it. Excellent. Thank you and the two women parted, exchanging charming smiles. Milady had told the truth, her head was confused, for her ill-arranged plans clashed one another like chaos. She required to be alone that she might put her thoughts a little into order. She saw vaguely the future, but she stood in need of a little silence and quiet to give all her ideas, as yet confused, a distinct form and a regular plan. What was most pressing was to get Madame Bonacieux away and convey her to a place of safety, and there, if matters required, make her a hostage. Milady began to have doubts of the issue of this terrible duel, in which her enemies showed as much perseverance as she did animosity. Besides, she felt as we feel when a storm is coming on, that this issue was near, and could not fail to be terrible. The principal thing for her, then, was, as we have said, to keep Madame Bonacieux in her power. Madame Bonacieux was the very life of D'Artagnan. This was more than his life, the life of the woman he loved. This was, in case of ill fortune, a means of temporizing and obtaining good conditions. Now, this point was settled. Madame Bonacieux, without any suspicion, accompanied her. Once concealed with her at Armentieres, it would be easy to make her believe that D'Artagnan had not come to Bethune, in fifteen days at most, Rochefort would be back. Besides, during that fifteen days she would have time to think how she could best avenge herself on the four friends. She would not be weary, thank God, for she should enjoy the sweetest pastime such events could accord a woman of her character, perfecting a beautiful vengeance. Resolving all this in her mind, she cast her eyes around her and arranged the topography of the garden in her head. Milady was like a good general, who contemplates at the same time victory and defeat, and who is quite prepared, according to the chances of the battle, to march forward or to beat a retreat. At the end of an hour she heard a soft voice calling her. It was Madame Bonacieux. The good abbess had naturally consented to her request, and as a commencement they were to sup together. On reaching the courtyard they heard the noise of a carriage which stopped at the gate. Milady listened. "'Do you hear anything?' said she. "'Yes, the rolling of a carriage. "'It is the one my brother sends for us. "'Oh, my God! "'Come, come, courage!' "'The bell of the convent gate was sounded. "'Milady was not mistaken. "'Go to your chamber,' said she to Madame Bonacieux. "'You have perhaps some jewels you would like to take?' "'I have his letters.' said she. 
well go and fetch them and come to my apartment we will snatch some supper we shall perhaps travel part of the night and we must keep up our strength great god said madame bonacieux placing her hand upon her bosom my heart beats so i cannot walk courage courage remember that in a quarter of an hour you will be safe and think that what you are about to do is for his sake yes yes everything for him you have restored my courage by a single word go i will rejoin you milady ran up to her apartment quickly she there found rochefort's lackey and gave him his instructions he was to wait at the gate if by chance the musketeers should appear the carriage was to set off as fast as possible pass around the convent and go and wait for milady at a little village which was situated at the other side of the wood in this case milady would cross the garden and gain the village on foot as we have already said milady was admirably acquainted with this part of france if the musketeers did not appear things were to go on as had been agreed madame bonacieux was to get into the carriage as if to bid her adieu and she was to take away madame bonacieux madame bonacieux came in and to remove all suspicion if she had any milady repeated to the lackey before her the latter part of her instructions milady asked some questions about the carriage it was a chaise drawn by three horses driven by a postillion rochefort's lackey would precede it as courier milady was wrong in fearing that madame bonacieux would have any suspicion the poor young woman was too pure to suppose that any female could be guilty of such perfidy besides the name of the comtesse de winter which she had heard the abbess pronounced was wholly unknown to her and she was even ignorant that a woman had had so great and so fatal a share in the misfortune of her life you see said she when the lackey had gone out everything is ready the abbess suspects nothing and believes that i am taken by order of the cardinal this man goes to give his last orders take the least thing drink a finger of wine and let us be gone yes said madame bonacieux mechanically yes let us be gone milady made her a sign to sit down opposite poured her a small glass of spanish wine and helped her to the wing of a chicken see said she if everything does not second us here is night coming on by daybreak we shall have reached our retreat and nobody can guess where we are come courage take something madame bonacieux ate a few mouthfuls mechanically and just touched the glass with her lips come come said milady lifting hers to her mouth do as i do but at the moment the glass touched her lips her hand remained suspended she heard something on the road which sounded like the rattling of a distant gallop then it grew nearer and it seemed to her almost at the same time that she heard the neighing of horses this noise acted upon her joy like the storm which awakens the sleeper in the midst of a happy dream she grew pale and ran to the window while madame bonacieux rising all in a tremble supported herself upon her chair to avoid falling nothing was yet to be seen only they heard the galloping draw nearer oh my god said madame bonacieux what is that noise that of either our friends or our enemies said milady with her terrible coolness stay where you are i will tell you madame bonacieux remained standing mute motionless and pale as a statue the noise became louder the horses could not be more than a hundred and fifty paces distant if they were not yet to be seen it was because the road made an elbow the noise became so distinct that the horses might be counted by the rattle of their hoofs milady gazed with all the power of her attention it was just light enough for her to see who was coming all at once at the turning of the road she saw the glitter of laced hats and the waving of feathers she counted two then five then eight horsemen one of them preceded the rest by double the length of his horse milady uttered a stifled groan in the first horseman she recognized d'artagnan oh my god my god cried madame bonacieux what is it it is the uniform of the cardinal's guards not an instant to be lost fly fly yes yes let us fly repeated madame bonacieux but without being able to make a step glued as she was to the spot by terror they heard the horsemen pass under the windows come then 
come then cried milady trying to drag the young woman along by the arm thanks to the garden we yet can flee i have the key but make haste in five minutes it will be too late madame bonacieux tried to walk made two steps and sank upon her knees milady tried to raise and carry her but could not do it at this moment they heard the rolling of the carriage which at the approach of the musketeers set off at a gallop then three or four shots were fired for the last time will you come cried milady oh my god my god you see my strength fails me you see plainly i cannot walk flee alone flee alone and leave you here no no never cried milady all at once she paused a livid flash darted from her eyes she ran to the table emptied into madame bonacieux's glass the contents of a ring which she opened with singular quickness it was a grain of a reddish color which dissolved immediately then taking the glass with a firm hand she said drink this wine will give you strength drink and she put the glass to the lips of the young woman who drank mechanically this is not the way that i wish to avenge myself said milady replacing the glass upon the table with an infernal smile but my faith we do what we can and she rushed out of the room madame bonacieux saw her go without being able to follow her she was like people who dream they are pursued and who in vain try to walk a few moments passed a great noise was heard at the gate every instant madame bonacieux expected to see milady but she did not return several times with terror no doubt the cold sweat burst from her burning brow at length she heard the grating of the hinges of the opening gates the noise of boots and spurs resounded on the stairs there was a great murmur of voices which continued to draw near amid which she seemed to hear her own name pronounced all at once she uttered a loud cry of joy and darted toward the door she had recognized the voice of d'artagnan 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 cried she is it you this way this way constance constance replied the young man where are you where are you my god at the same moment the door of the cell yielded to a shock rather than opened several men rushed into the chamber madame bonacieux had sunk into an armchair without the power of moving d'artagnan threw down a yet smoking pistol which he held in his hand and fell on his knees before his mistress athos replaced his in his belt porthos and aramis who held their drawn swords in their hands returned them to their scabbards oh d'artagnan my beloved d'artagnan you have come then at last you have not deceived me it is indeed thee yes yes constance reunited oh it was in vain she told me you would not come i hoped in silence i was not willing to fly oh i have done well how happy i am at this word she athos who had seated himself quietly started up she what she asked d'artagnan why my companion she who out of friendship for me wished to take me from my persecutors she who mistaking you for the cardinal's guards has just fled away your companion cried d'artagnan becoming more pale than the white veil of his mistress of what companion are you speaking dear constance of her whose carriage was at the gate of a woman who calls herself your friend of a woman to whom you have told everything her name her name cried d'artagnan my god can you not remember her name yes it was pronounced in my hearing once stop but it is very strange oh my god my head swims i cannot see help help my friends her hands are icy cold cried d'artagnan she is ill great god she is losing her senses while porthos was calling for help with all the power of his strong voice aramis ran to the table to get a glass of water but he stopped at seeing the horrible alteration that had taken place in the countenance of athos who standing before the table his hair rising from his head his eyes fixed in stupor was looking at one of the glasses and appeared a prey to the most horrible doubt oh 
said Athos. Oh, no, it is impossible. God would not permit such a crime. Water, water, cried D'Artagnan. Water! Oh, poor woman, poor woman, murmured Athos in a broken voice. Madame Bonacieux opened her eyes under the kisses of D'Artagnan. She revives, cried the young man. Oh, my God, my God, I thank thee. Madame, said Athos, Madame, in the name of heaven, whose empty glass is this? Mine, monsieur, said the young woman in a dying voice. But who poured the wine for you that was in this glass? She. But who is she? Oh, I remember, said Madame Bonacieux, the Comtesse de Winter. The four friends uttered one and the same cry, but that of Athos dominated all the rest. At that moment, the countenance of Madame Bonacieux became livid. A fearful agony pervaded her frame, and she sank panting into arms of Porthos and Aramis. D'Artagnan seized the hands of Athos with an anguish difficult to be described. "'And what do you believe?' His voice was stifled by sobs. "'I believe everything,' said Athos, biting his lips till the blood sprang to avoid sighing. "'D'Artagnan! D'Artagnan!' cried Madame Bonacieux. "'Where art thou? Do not leave me. You see, I am dying.' D'Artagnan released the hands of Athos, which he still held clasped in both his own, and hastened to her. Her beautiful face was distorted with agony. Her glassy eyes had no longer their sight. A convulsive shuddering shook her whole body. The sweat rolled from her brow. "'In the name of heaven, run, call! Aramis, Porthos, call for help!' "'Useless,' said Athos, "'useless, for the poison which she pours, there is no antidote.' "'Yes, yes, help, help!' murmured Madame Bonacieux. "'Help!' Then, collecting all her strength, she took the head of the young man between her hands, looked at him for an instant as if her whole soul passed into that look, and with a sobbing cry pressed her lips to his. "'Constance! Constance!' cried D'Artagnan. A sigh escaped from the mouth of Madame Bonacieux, and dwelt for an instant on the lips of D'Artagnan. That sigh was the soul, so chaste and so loving, which reascended to heaven. D'Artagnan pressed nothing but a corpse in his arms. The young man uttered a cry, and fell by the side of his mistress as pale and as icy as herself. Porthos wept. Aramis pointed toward heaven. Athos made the sign of the cross. At that moment a man appeared in the doorway almost as pale as those in the chamber. He looked around him and saw Madame Bonacieux dead, and D'Artagnan in a swoon. He appeared just at that moment of stupor which follows great catastrophes. "'I was not deceived,' said he. "'Here is Monsieur d'Artagnan, and you are his friends, Messieurs Athos, Porthos, and Aramis.' The persons whose names were thus pronounced looked at the stranger with astonishment. It seemed to all three that they knew him. "'Gentlemen,' resumed the newcomer, "'you are as I am, in search of a woman who,' added he with a terrible smile, "'must have passed this way, for I see a corpse.' The three friends remained mute, for although the voice as well as the countenance reminded them of someone they had seen, they could not remember under what circumstances. "'Gentlemen,' continued the stranger, "'since you do not recognize a man who probably owes his life to you twice, I must name myself. I am Lord de Winter, brother-in-law of that woman.' The three friends uttered a cry of surprise. Athos rose, and offering him his hand, "'Be welcome, my lord,' said he. "'You are one of us.' "'I set out five hours after her from Portsmouth,' said Lord de Winter. 
I arrived three hours after her at Boulogne. I missed her by twenty minutes at St. Omer. Finally, at Lilliers, I lost all trace of her. I was going about at random, inquiring of everybody, when I saw you gallop past. I recognized Monsieur d'Artagnan. I called to you, but you did not answer me. I wished to follow you, but my horse was too much fatigued to go at the same pace with yours. And yet it appears, in spite of all your diligence, you have arrived too late. You see, said Athos, pointing to Madame Bonacieux, dead, and to D'Artagnan, whom Porthos and Aramis were trying to recall to life. Are they both dead? asked Lord de Winter sternly. No, replied Athos. Fortunately, Monsieur D'Artagnan has only fainted. Ah, indeed, so much the better, said Lord de Winter. At that moment D'Artagnan opened his eyes. He tore himself from the arms of Porthos and Aramis and threw himself like a madman on the corpse of his mistress. Athos rose, walked toward his friend with a slow and solemn step, embraced him tenderly, and as he burst into violent sobs, he said to him with his noble and persuasive voice, "'Friend, be a man. Women weep for the dead. Men, avenge them.' "'Oh, yes,' cried D'Artagnan. "'Yes, if it be to avenge her, I am ready to follow you.' Athos profited by this moment of strength which the hope of vengeance restored to his unfortunate friend to make a sign to Porthos and Aramis to go and fetch the superior. The two friends met her in the corridor. Greatly troubled and much upset by such strange events, she called some of the nuns who, against all monastic custom, found themselves in the presence of five men. "'Madame,' said Athos, passing his arm under that of D'Artagnan, we abandon to your pious care the body of that unfortunate woman. She was an angel on earth before being an angel in heaven. Treat her as one of your sisters. We will return some day to pray over her grave. D'Artagnan concealed his face in the bosom of Athos and sobbed aloud. Weep, said Athos. Weep, heart full of love, youth, and life. Alas! Would I could weep like you. And he drew away his friend, as affectionate as a father, as consoling as a priest, noble as a man who has suffered much. All five, followed by their lackeys leading their horses, took their way to the town of Bethune, whose outskirts they perceived, and stopped before the first inn they came to. But, said D'Artagnan, shall we not pursue that woman? Later said Athos. I have measures to take. She will escape us, replied the young man. She will escape us, and it will be your fault, Athos. I will be accountable for her, said Athos. D'Artagnan had so much confidence in the word of his friend that he lowered his head and entered the inn without reply. Porthos and Aramis regarded each other, not understanding this assurance of Athos. Lord de Winter believed he spoke in this manner to soothe the grief of D'Artagnan. "'Now, gentlemen,' said Athos, when he had ascertained there were five chambers free in the hotel, "'let everyone retire to his own apartment. D'Artagnan needs to be alone, to weep and to sleep. I take charge of everything. Be easy.' "'It appears, however,' said Lord de Winter, "'if there are any measures to take against the Countess,' It concerns me. She is my sister-in-law. And me, said Athos. She is my wife. D'Artagnan smiled, for he understood that Athos was sure of his vengeance when he revealed such a secret. Porthos and Aramis looked at each other and grew pale. Lord de Winter thought Athos was mad. Now retire to your chambers, said Athos, and leave me to act. You must perceive that in my quality of a husband this concerns me. Only, D'Artagnan, if you have not lost it, give me the paper which fell from that man's hat, upon which is written the name of the village of— Ah, said D'Artagnan, I comprehend that name written in her hand. 
"'You see, then,' said Athos, "'there is a god in heaven still.'" End of chapter 63 Recording by John Van Stan Savannah, Georgia